We have to look at the big patterns of Greek, Roman, and Egyptian religion. And it's very common in these systems to have a, uh, a parent deity and a, a child deity. I mean, you see this all, all over Greek mythology as well. Zeus is father of uh, Heracles or Hercules who then performs labors and then his son is, is fully deified and rises to heaven. Uh, even a more pertinent example is, is Zeus as father of Dionysius because the Zeus Dionysius pair is very special to Orphic thought. Interesting. And it, in this case, Dionysius as a child dies and is ripped apart by evil characters called Titans. And then he is, he only has his beating heart remain. His beating heart is preserved. And then his, from that, his body is put back together. So unlike Humpty Dumpty, he, he does get to be resurrected. And, <laughs> uh, and out of this, out of this comes a, a religion of, of what you could call, you might call resurrection, but um, our resuscitation, but I think it's probably a resurrection is fine because Dionysus grows up as a deity, as a son of Zeus, despite having died. And so he carries with him the, the mystery of life. And that secret story of how Dionysius dies and is reborn then becomes central to the Orphic mysteries. In the case of, of e Egyptian religious lore, you see this also. Um, Amon or Re, sometimes combined, um, is a father deity. And you have Hermes, interestingly, being a father deity to Isis in this literature. So there's a father daughter relationship. You obviously have Osiris, Isis, and then Horus as the kind of primal triad, father, mother, son. Right. Father, mother, son appears in Christian Trinitarian literature in Nagamati sources. It's the father, mother, son pattern of the Trinity is very common in Sethian lore or so-called Sethian lore. For instance, in the Apocryphon or Secret Book of John, Jesus is one of the first things Jesus says is, I'm the father, I'm the mother, I'm the son. That early pattern of Trinitarian speculation uh, is, is based on a family model. And so we, we do see, we do see in, in religious lore, and, and I'm, I'm intentionally not calling this religious lore of mythology because that carries uh, the most important thing probably for your viewers to know is that ancient people really believed this stuff. And so to yeah. call it mythology gives the wrong impression because it wasn't mythology to them. It was just their own religion. <laughs> I 100% so agree with that. Just as like a, a Christian today wouldn't refer to the Gospels as mythology. Right. They would refer to it as history. So I'm, I'm trying to play fair to them. But yes, this pattern of father, son, or father, mother, son, or father, daughter is, or even mother, son, as in the case of Isis and Osiris, your readers are, you sorry, your viewers are probably very familiar with that icon of, of Isis lactating or breastfeeding Horus, yep. which becomes a model for Mary feeding the baby Jesus. And uh, that's extremely well documented. The Christians are, are just sort of re remolding that iconography. So yes, obviously there is there's an influence, but I think the short answer there and, and something to avoid is 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 simplistic sort of genetic connections between one and two things. What what is important is to understand that there's a whole culture here and and scores of stories. So that one has to again really seek to get the big picture. And that takes a lot of study before you're able to say. All right. Well, who really could have had an impact on who, when, where, and how? It's a really good point. And so, and yeah, that I, that's well well put. Now with Hermes though, Hermes seems to be like some sort of mediator. 
I wonder if there's more going on there as like archetypal wise, not one and one, like you said, but I would say, cause people like to say Horace and Jesus have so much in common, but I would, I don't know if you agree with me. I think Hermes and Jesus probably have more in common. What do you think? I mean, do you, do you agree or do you think it's a little more complicated than that? Just a, to yes or no to that. Well, they have the basics in common. They're both viewed as deities by those who worship them. They are also both viewed as sages who are in the deep past. Now, obviously, Jesus is much, much, much more recent than, than Hermes. But from the perspective of today, Jesus is, you know, as far back as, as any modern person would probably care to remember. Um, in, in antiquity, that wasn't the case. In antiquity, Jesus was still, uh, you know, hot off the press. But the idea of there being a sage who has access to more ancient wisdom, because Jesus sort of is, is for Christians, the gateway to a more ancient wisdom, which is mosaic, that is from Moses. So there, there's that type of there's that typology of sage. There's that typology of divine sage, deity. There's also the typology of divine sage who reveals secret lore from heaven. And the father, and, too. And the father. And, and Hermes himself uh, ha is, is subordinate to the hermetic creator god. So that's an, also important to remember. So there is a, for, for hermetic, people or hermetists if you will there is a primal deity who is unspeakable and unknowable and in some hermetic texts he is described as a as a creator and that's most famously in the in the Kore Cosmu and then Hermes who may or may not be identical with one of the planets known as Mercury is subordinate to this creator, but then Hermes is is higher on the rank than say Isis because Hermes gives birth to Isis, who then gives birth to Horus, and then the, these traditions are are passed wow. down. That's the way I view that the influence is not one to one. It's not like Hermes and Hermet Hermetism Hermeticism is affecting Christianity or that Christianity is affecting Hermeticism. It's more of they belong to a general culture. Both religious movements belong to a general culture in which secrecy and secrecy motifs gains social capital. So those freelance religious experts who come into an ancient city and are able to say, guess what, everybody? I have some secret teaching from a sage very, very long ago, and it's just been revealed to moi, you know, <laughs> and this sort of generates a lot of interest because it's like, oh, okay, well, there you go. Um, this, this is really old stuff and a really cool stuff, and it's just been revealed. And this guy, or on occasion, this gal wants to reveal it mm -hmm. and has found these secret books or secret tablets or whatnot and has the wisdom to decipher the letters and bada bing bada boom wow that's a lot of social capital accrued immediately off the bat if 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 these freelance religious experts are e exposing secrets and of course when they expose the secrets they expose them after a ceremony of initiation so in this kind of religious formation, the teacher tells you, I've got some basic teaching for like the outsiders, and then I've got the advanced stuff for the insiders. And this is a very common structure of how religious lore was communicated in antiquity and to some degree today. If you want access to the advanced religious lore, you've got to go through some kind of initiation. Now, for Christians, that would be a baptism, baptism right. which gives you access to a sacred meal, aka the Eucharist. For Hermes, wow. this might involve other 
other things. And an initiation could be anything. It's sort of like a, a fraternity sort of uh, kind of a thing. Uh, when you when you think of initiation, sometimes they involve rituals that are painful. Sometimes they involve going into a dark room and hearing a story, holding up a light, starting a fire, jumping over a fire. It could be anything, and anything can be involved in your initiation. And after your initiation is complete, you become a full member of the community. And then you get more and more access to the secret information, which is revealed piecemeal by the teacher. So when the Christians get around to writing up the stories of Jesus, this pattern of religious lore and instruction is so built into their minds because it's so common. You find it everywhere in the Greek mysteries of Eleusis, of Samothrace. Uh, you find it in even mystery cults dealing with the imperial rulers. I believe Mithra has an like initiation thing too. Exactly. You find it in the Mithras cult. So any, any religious formation can make use of this structure. And Christianity also made use of this structure. And when they got around to depicting Jesus in the Gospels, which are fairly late products, they depicted it in him as, at least partially, as a sage revealing his wisdom piecemeal and revealing more to insiders. So to outsiders, he gives children's stories and funny anecdotes. They don't really understand. They go away. Some of them who are interested want to keep on. Then there's a, an inner circle of 12, and they go inside and they get access to the true meaning of the parable, the mystery of the kingdom of God. So the Christians are very, very carefully co-opting this theme which is everywhere pervasive in Greek, Roman, and Egyptian religion. Well put. And um, I also think it's interesting. I, I couldn't help but to think of the Nag Hammadi's text, and which is also from Egypt. So it, it makes sense to me that there would be influences of Hermeticism. And in particular, I'm thinking of the story of Jesus talking to the disciples and asking them who they think he is. And they're all answering, I think you're the Messiah. I think you're the son of man. I think you're son of God, whatever. And then finally it gets to, I think it was like Mary, I think Mary Magdalene or something. It was like Peter or Mary. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe you know this, but one of them says, if I said who you are, everybody would kill me. And I guess the person, I guess it's like insi insinuating that he's God himself. And like, that's like a no, no, which is interesting because it reminds me of this like secret wisdom thing that you see in the, in the Hermetica. Yes, you're referring to the Gospel of Thomas uh, saying 13, where Thomas is told three secret words from Jesus, and the other disciples are jealous, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they want Thomas to, to reveal to them what the three secret words are. And Thomas says, if I did so, you would take up stones and stone me, and then fire would come out of the stones and burn you alive. Whoa. So <laughs> the, the idea of secrecy is very, very strongly rooted in Christianity, but it's also one of the most common aspects of Greek and Roman and Egyptian religions at right. the time. They loved mysteries. They loved that. And, and so that, that is not common. Christianity has no special claim on that whatsoever. Right. 